Donald John Trump do solemnly swear that I will faithfully... I'm Ashley Parker, White House correspondent with The Washington Post. That I will faithfully execute the office of president... I'm Matthew Nussbaum, White House reporter at Politico. The office of president of the United States. Jim Tankersley, policy and politics editor at Vox.com. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the Kimberly United States. Kimberly Atkins, Chief Washington Reporter for the Boston Herald. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me Michael God. Michael Scheer, I'm White House Correspondent for the New York Times. Congratulations, Mr. President. The Trump administration is like no other beat I've ever had. The first word that comes to mind is it's stressful uh, and it's nonstop. Tiring and um, intense. It's been, you know, seven days a week. We're sort of all figuring it out on the fly, the reporters who cover him, and it sometimes feels like the administration itself. And we're jumping from issue to issue. You know, things are just moving so quickly. Um, and it's just like an avalanche of information every single day. They're true outsiders. They're not approaching Washington like insiders at all. And they're making a lot of um, controversy because of being outsiders. They're really breaking the China, so to speak, in Washington's establishment. The fact that the press has been declared to be the opposition by this administration sort of sets the tone. You're always on the edge of your seat wondering what's coming next. Donald Trump hasn't been president 100 days yet, uh, and it feels like he's been off in office for quite a while. He's sort of a, a fascinating figure. You know, his relationship with the truth uh, can be a little bit shaky sometimes. Um, I first met him at um, this interview that he did uh, right after the election at the New York Times uh, headquarters up in New York, which was kind of scheduled, and then he canceled it via Twitter, and we all canceled our flights. Um, and then two hours later, he said, well, actually, it's on again. And so then we all like scrambled to get up to New York. He's very um, charismatic, very big personality, fills a room. But he's also exactly what you see, like completely distracted from one minute to the next. Donald Trump is someone who loves the media attention, but also loves to absolutely excoriate the media. I mean, think about it. He's a guy who came from reality television. Ratings matter to him, and he takes very uh, great pride in the fact that he could get good ratings. And when his coverage is bad, that looks like a bad rating, bad polls, he, it really upsets him. And his, uh, his approach is to counterpunch, so that sets up a very adversarial relationship with the press. And one thing I learned even during the campaign is that he's constantly trying to win over the group of people in front of him. And it's the same way with journalists. As much as he will demonize us in public and sort of enjoy that feisty back and forth in a press briefing. The leaks are absolutely real. The, the news is fake because so much of the news is fake. If you're alone with him in the Oval Office or speaking to him off the record or, or interviewing him, again, he can be very warm and charismatic and compelling. And I think you even saw, I mean, it is this weird symbiotic relationship because, for instance, even when health care went down and he was furious, he was very angry, he felt he'd been treated unfairly by the media, the first person he called to explain it was a reporter from the Washington Post. And the second person he called, or who he accepted a call from, was a reporter from the New York Times. <laughs> What's been fascinating about the first 100 days is that motion hasn't really turned into anything on most issues, but uh, it could. It, it's, we've still got a long presidency to go. On policy, he is fundamentally disinterested in details in a way we have not seen from an American president in a really long time. He just doesn't seem to care about how you make job creation bills actually work in the House, or how you would make a health care plan. He absolutely didn't care about the details. He just wanted to win. And he keeps promising big sweeping things. It's going to be great. Everyone's going to love it. We're going to have a health care plan that's going to be second to none. It's going to be great. But the problem with that is you have to have details that are great and everyone loves, and Trump does not appear remotely interested in crafting those details to a degree that might actually sell them to people out in the country. If the president or his people are telling falsehoods, we need to say that they're falsehoods. Um, on the other hand, if the president has a, you know, a successful moment, he got his Supreme Court nominee through, um, you know, we need to document what that means for the court and for the laws and whatever, but we also need to say that was a successful moment for the president. I think we've managed to do both by, you know, by really being firm about telling people what's true and what's not true. 
So one thing that readers don't get to see, uh, that we see in covering this administration, is the way they pick and choose what media outlets that they like. They will pick the reporters that they want to allow to ask a question, and generally they'll give them a better seat uh, so that someone doesn't come and get you and say, come a little closer. You know you're probably not going to get a question asked um, in that event. Being in the briefing every day is fascinating. Um, it, it gets so much attention uh, that past press briefings from the press secretary haven't gotten the, the three major networks here carry it almost every day, and people really tune into it. But the reality is, oh, no, no, hold on. No, at some point, report the facts. You, you, I know. On Capitol Hill. No, no, I, I get it, but you keep, I, I, so I'm sorry that that disgusts you. You're shaking your head. I appreciate it, but, but. And so often, okay, news is actually made at these briefings, uh, whether because there's just so much happening in this administration or because Sean Spicer stumbles into some kind of controversial comment. Someone as despicable as Hitler, who didn't even sink to the, to the, to using chemical weapons. And you see moments unfold and you think, okay, we're probably going to be seeing that on SNL in a week or two. A Wall Street Journal, are, are you okay? Come on. <laughs> but I don't know if readers sort of see some of the daily franticness um, we see behind the scenes at the White House. And you're sort of waiting for the rest of the circus to walk through. And in other White Houses, my sense was it was a sort of more orderly, disciplined process. We're constantly battling over getting briefings for things um, simple as he'll sign an executive order and not give us the text of the executive order. <laughs> so, you know, you're left to write a story on the internet, you know, post a story quickly, um, describing what it is that the president just signed, but you have no idea what the president just signed. <laughs> I think the most shocking incident uh, in covering this administration as a reporter probably happened on day two. It was when uh, the press secretary, Sean Spicer, called his very first press conference. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. Now, it was unusual in a number of ways. One, it was the day after the inauguration, so nothing had really happened yet. It was the day of the Women's March where more than half a million people came here to D.C., I just thought to myself, is this real life? I mean, is this really happening, that having his press secretary call a press conference to blast accurate reports that the crowds who came out to see him were smaller than those that President Obama got at his inauguration? At that point, I knew that I could expect anything and everything from this uh, administration and that covering it will be uh, something like I've never done before. You know, the, the Sean Spicer briefing has sort of become this amazing reality show that people tune into. It's sort of much must-watch television. Uh, quote, Hitler didn't even sink to the level of using chemical weapons. What did you mean by that? I, thank you. I appreciate that. There was not in the, in the he brought him into the, to, um, to the Holocaust Center, I understand that. My eyebrows briefly had a star turn when they went viral the, <laughs> the other week, and it's a good reminder that there's so much fascination with this president, with Sean Spicer, that in a weird way, even the reporters, whether you want to or not, and I should say we don't want to, sort of become, we'll have cameos in this kind of stage that is the briefing room. <laughs> So I was I didn't know there was a camera on me then, um, but it is always a good reminder that, you know, everything's on the record. <laughs> Almost none of them have ever, ever had experience being inside the White House, and it's a peculiar place. If you say to this White House, oh, well, it's always been done this other way, then they're, like, dead certain to not do it that way. I mean, they just, they just do not seem to have any sense of wanting to just sort of hold on to any of those traditions. They want to blow things up. The Obama administration prided itself in transparency and they did a lot of things like put out blogs and put out videos and Facebook posts in an effort to get out all of this information. But as a reporter, trying to get in specific information related to your story and not just about things that they wanted to talk about could have been difficult. A access was not a, a forte of the Obama administration and I think people don't always realize that because of the way they went around the press uh, in all of those ways. Now, of course, President Trump also also goes around the press with Twitter, um, but in the process of it, he's more uh, eager to pick fights with the press in the way that President Obama didn't do. So the Obama administration was not as cozy with the press as a lot of people 
think, where the press was not as cozy with the Obama administration as a lot of people think, they denied, for example, a lot of our open records requests. But it was a more traditional relationship than Trump has with the press. There was an expectation that if you called the White House for comment, they would call you back. The Trump administration just hasn't done that. They absolutely will ignore you if they don't want to deal with your questions. And they seem totally willing to just say one thing one day, say a different thing the next day, and, and act as if it's no big deal. Those tweets with Donald Trump are sort of like a window into exactly what that man is thinking at that exact second. Um, and so from a journalist's point of view, it, it can be wonderful because you don't have to go through the filter of the aid, aides or the filter of a press release. Um, you know, this is what the president thinks right now. This is what's bothering him. This is what he just saw on TV, and this is what he's tweeting about. So it's a great snapshot into what he's thinking in that moment. I mean, I set my phone uh, to uh, get automatic alerts, push alerts, when the president tweets. It's something that's totally new. I mean, there is an internal struggle when you say to yourself, do you have to report on every tweet the president makes? But this is the president of the United States. When he tweets, he is giving pronouncements. Sometimes his, his tweets really do create stories. They create news cycles. He has this amazing ability to command the narrative, for good or for bad, just by typing in 100 characters. A lot of times I feel like Alice through the looking glass where nothing is what you expect it to be. And so I look at my job as to say, all right, it's okay to be Alice and it's okay to be in this wacky place, but I have to remember that my readers are in reality. And it's my job to give the context of what's happening in terms of that reality. I think it's just so ingrained in, in what we do and just telling people uh, what's happening and, and giving them that story and that insight uh, without our opinions. I haven't found covering him objectively to be any more difficult than, than covering Congress objectively. And if you're a good reporter, ideally you know, you know how they make decisions under pressure, what they're like when they're tired, what they're like as a father and husband, um, how they treat their staff when no one else is looking. And so those are the stories that I'm always gravitating towards. Our goal is to go after the truth. It doesn't matter if it's a Democratic president or a Republican president. And you know, while there are media outlets out there that are really opinionated, that's not our role. The New York Times' role is to take whatever administration is in front of us and hold them to account.